Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to another of our local history shows. Uh, this show is a little different from some of the others. Um, my guest this evening is Mr. Roderick D. McDonald, who has been in St. Thomas for 25 years, uh, associated with several of the industries. Uh, Rod, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, you're going to be on the show, and I look forward to discussing the really interesting career that uh, you have had in Canada. And I think before we start, I'm just going to give our audience a brief survey. Uh, Rod McDonald is uh, qualified in all these areas, architectural engineering, metallurgy, drafting, automotive engineering. He's a radio and electronic expert, a ham operator of uh, renown. He's also an airplane pilot, and he is a management consultant. And uh, Rod, what I thought we'd do is just go back to the beginning and uh, we'll trace your life chronologically. There are a couple of areas we want to uh, concentrate on, your war experiences, uh, when you are with uh, worked for C.D. Howe, and uh, then your uh, industrial experience in St. Thomas, plus some other uh, uh, stories. <clears throat> uh, can you just tell us about your early background in Montreal? Uh, really, George, I don't know how far back uh, <laughs> we want to go. A kindergarten ought to be a good place. Right? Yeah. Well, we can uh, pass yeah. through that pretty quickly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, I went to Westmount Junior and High Schools in uh, Westmount, which is a suburb of and in the middle of the uh, city of Montreal. And I went to Lower Canada College, which was an English-oriented uh, schooling. And I was a boarder there, which was most interesting. And I was able to flee some of the family uh, uh, control when I was in the boarding school. Then I took university entrance examinations. But by this time, you know, I was beginning to uh, get a little bored with education. Of course, you're an educationalist, and you wouldn't understand this. Yeah, yeah I can understand <laughs> that. So uh, I decided I'd go to go to work, uh -huh. and I went to work in construction industry. Now, it's kind of important that uh, at this time I was being coerced, if I could use the word, to educate myself to join my father in his business as an architect. And uh, I really didn't want to do this, so I went to work for a contractor, construction contractor. Well, after about two or three years of that, I realized that I wasn't going to get anywhere else unless I did something more about education. So I took my entrance exams to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, the course there was a little different than was available in Canada because of its broadness and scope. I took uh, architecture, architectural engineering, then I got interested in sculpture, so I uh, got involved in that uh, in a competitive way. And then when uh, I came back to Montreal, I took an extension course in metallurgy because I felt there was a little vacancy in my information or knowledge at that time. So I took that in McGill. Uh, having reached this stage, I joined the firm of Ross and McDonald Architects. And uh, do you want to proceed with that, or uh, do you well, want to uh, go off? No, on I'm a interested in the fact that uh, um, you think I'm the uh, because I've been in education. I think school is a be-all and end-all. It isn't at all. I quite agree that. Uh, you were probably better off to quit school and get out and work at something practical, and then you realized that you wanted education, further education, you went back and get it. Now, it uh, seems to me that's the ideal way we should uh, educate our people. Well, <clears throat> it does help to do it that way. <clears throat> it led to uh, an altercation that I had with one of my uh, professors at MIT. He uh, I sensed that he didn't really like me too well, and then I found out that he'd married a Canadian, and that might have been the trouble. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. when you get into this kind of thing, 
uh, he was quite surprised to have a student uh, tell him that the student didn't think he was getting his money's worth. And uh, this is an aspect that perhaps may not have occurred to too many people, <clears throat> that you know and you realize how much uh, benefits you're really getting from your course. Yes, I think the practical experience we now have in, uh, in uh, uh, Canada, several universities that do give uh, degrees now by uh, varying three months at college and three months out yep. on a job. And you, I uh, understand you'd highly approve I'd of that. I'd already had the experience on yes. the job. Yeah, yeah you had had that. Well, <clears throat> your father was in the architectural business in uh, Montreal, and you came back and you went to work for him, and you worked in architecture for a while. Uh, now, what are some of the buildings that uh, you worked on in Montreal? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when I went to uh, work with the firm, uh, I naturally landed right into the drafting room, and uh, I started working on the Montreal Neurological Institute and, uh, and the homeopathic hospital. I was interested in uh, hospital design, and uh, I started on the drawings. Then I moved over into the engineering department and I got busy with the work of designing plumbing, heating, and ventilating systems for these two buildings, as well as compressed air, oxygen, and some of the other services that are provided in a hospital. Well then, <clears throat> I was getting a little bit uh, uncomfortable being cooped up inside and uh, I went outside to supervise the two jobs that I had worked on and did the drafting and engineering for. Uh, that was uh, the thing that really got me started and an interest uh, in construction supervision because it's all very well for the architect or the engineer to design a good system, but when somebody else has to build it and it's necessary to interpret the architect's ideas uh, to the man that's going to build it. And at the same time, you have to contend with the uh, owner of the building or, or his representative arriving to uh, watch the progress or lack of it. Uh, you become a sort of a moderator of a lot of different points of view. And this is one of the interesting things about doing construction supervision. A little later, I did some uh, additions to the Montreal Eaton store. And in this particular case, I did not do the drafting at all. I spent all the time on the job, uh, on the supervision. Also, the whole Renfrew store in Montreal. And I got a little bit into institutional work. I hope this is not going to be boring, but... No, 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 go ahead. I, I got into a little institutional work and uh, built two YMCA buildings and one Young Men's Hebrew Association building in Montreal, and then did alteration work for a number of uh, industries. Among them was the Red Path Sugar Refinery. There was one job that uh, I found extremely interesting. Christchurch Cathedral in Montreal is lies between the Morgan and Eaton store, Morgan now called the Bay, uh, right at Phillips Square, and it had a stone spire. And we were across town and were setting up a transit one day that had been repaired, and we poked it out the window and spotted the spire, and somebody says, holy smoke, that thing is, is leaning, it's not straight. <laughs> so we found that the top of the spire was leaning out 18 inches towards Phillips Square. Uh, that job required taking each stone out of the spire, measuring it, and making a drawing of where it came from, because we were going to rebuild that spire, not in stone, but in cast aluminum, sections of cast aluminum to imitate the stone in dimension, uh, thickness, and, uh, and of course it was bolted on the superstructure. Well, Listen, Rod, can I just interrupt you for a yeah. minute? You, you discovered that this spire was out of alignment just by yeah. accident. Quite by accident. And then you go to see the church authorities and tell them that they have a problem. Well, we told them they had somewhat of a lien, you see, yeah. this boy. Well, yeah. that, that's true. Yeah. So, of course, you had two problems there. You had to get the weight off, yeah. and that meant taking down the spire. And the second thing was you had to go underneath and jack up the foundations. And golly, those, 
those foundations, I think that church was probably built in 1870 or something like that. They've been there a long time, and they had lime mortar in them, and, you know, they were a little tired. Uh, we took it down. That was an interesting job, and it gave me my first experience in heights, because I had to go up with the uh, steeplejack and uh, start measuring the stones and help him take them, actually take them out. So sitting in a bosun's chair all day is a little tiring. At the same time, when you get into a wind, it can be a little uh, uncomfortable. Frightening, I so, would think, eh? The one other job in, uh, in Montreal, and I think that was the Montreal Postal Terminal, I had for the first time <clears throat> an opportunity to use my MIT architectural uh, experience along with engineering. And uh, this, uh, uh, this job included the mail handling equipment, the mechanical equipment, and its installation and operation. So that pretty well took care of the Montreal end of it. Well, listen, Rod, while uh, this is in the 30s that uh, you're working in Montreal and uh, uh, it's kind of a depression time, uh, and of course at that time we're slowly building towards war, That's and right. uh, uh, nobody was prepared for that war. I think Canada didn't have much in the way of a navy or an air force or an army or anything else, and then all of a sudden we find we're in the war. And uh, this is a part of your experience I think we'd like to move into now. Um, uh, because of your uh, work in construction and your engineering and so on, uh, you became, uh, you were hired by C.D. Howe. That's right. Uh, and yeah. C.D. Howe was the man who ran the war effort in Canada, really, didn't he, during That's the war. Remarkable right. man. There's just a new biography of him out. Now, <clears throat> uh, what, what were the main, what was the problem that uh, C.D. Howe had right away? I mean, all of a sudden you say, get the country ready to fight a war. Eh? Well, of course, as you <coughs> said, there's been books written on this uh, subject, and uh, I have not seen too many of them, and especially no. this new one you mentioned. It didn't happen all, all at once. Uh, you correctly stated that uh, we were moving slowly towards it, and it accelerated the closer we got to 1939 and 40. Uh, the, in Ottawa, in anticipation of uh, military production uh, would be needed, as well as uh, building up their armed forces themselves, the Department of Munitions and Supply was formed to set up a procurement agency that would arrange the purchase of uh, uh, engines of war and uh, airplanes, uh, tanks, and so forth. Uh, Mr. Howe became minister of uh, the Department of Munitions and Supply, and uh, this uh, this uh, job of that he took on was a very fortunate choice. And I may touch on a little later, touch yeah. on some of the aspects of Mr. Howe that perhaps are not as well known as some of the ones that are written about. Well, at this time, and I have to divert a little bit, I was uh, taking flying instruction to Little Norway down on the Montreal Island in exchange for some uh, instruction on my part on the use and uh, operation of uh, airborne and ground radio systems for aircraft control. This worked out great. I got to meet people that couldn't speak English, and uh, they also ran into a situation where they didn't even understand English, and I had to work through an interpreter, and this uh, was a little bit laborious. But for two hours of flying time, uh, I exchanged two hours of classes in this particular subject. Well, was that your first pilot license then, or did you, no, you uh, qualified I earlier? Took, I took the instruction, all right, but <clears throat> a little later, uh, because I was doing other work and I could not devote any more time at the uh, 
at Little Norway, and they already had, were developing their own instructors. I switched over in spare time to the uh, Toronto Flying Club. Oh, yeah. And uh, I got my uh, private pilot's license there. Well, as you probably remember, in the war, if you knew anything about anything, you were an expert. Yeah. <laughs> and the mere fact that I was a ham radio man and electronic specialist in certain areas and had uh, a pilot's license, that was uh, very favorable towards uh, getting into this wartime kind of work. So I was sent to Washington and uh, took over the job of director of the aircraft division of this Department of uh, Munitions and Supply. There's quite a story about the way it happened, actually, that I went down there, but I don't think i uh, spend the time on it. Uh, well, Rod, can I just interrupt there a minute? You go down to Washington, and uh, uh, we have to equip an Army and a Navy and an Air Force, and uh, uh, you uh, met for nearly everybody who was anything in flying in the States. Uh, you met all these people in the various companies, and uh, uh, this is a time Germany still wasn't, or the United, United States. States wasn't in the war yet. That's right. And uh, there were all kinds of German spies in the States who were trying to find out things. What about the security of that time? Uh, uh, were they just making it up as they went along, or? Uh, well, they, Canada started the war with a security organization as it applied to manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, that hadn't been updated to any great extent since the First World War. The uh, armed forces had pretty good uh, security organizations, which was more or less internal, but for the kind of thing that we were doing, which was involved in the purchase or procurement of uh, munitions of war, there wasn't any real background, and we had to develop it ourselves. And uh, that is something that is with you right through the war, no matter what you do, is the ele element of security as to whether any of it is going to get away. And uh, as far as I'm aware, very little, if anything, ever did get away. It worked out reasonably well. Uh, well uh so not only do you have the difficulties of procurement down there, and uh, the Americans themselves were in the midst of design changes, and uh, really the Americans realized their air force and their airplane design was way behind the German and the British, didn't they? And they had to not only catch up with that, but they uh, kind of had to produce new planes. Uh, you. Uh, have you had any experiences about, uh, now I, as I understand it, you just had to sort of, uh, you went into any aircraft company you wanted, you had the entree, yes. and uh, uh, you must have met everybody who amounted to anything in the airplane business there, eh? Well, it depends who is defining it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think a, a nice story I, I, uh, you must tell is the time about uh, you went to visit the Admiral and met Admiral Byrd. Eh? Oh, yeah. Well, of course you've uh, you've mentioned the man's name, but <clears throat> I had some business to transact in the office of the chief of naval operations one afternoon, and I went down there, and this the admiral's secretary said to me, uh, "He's expecting you, and he's got a friend of yours in there, and uh, uh, go right in." <clears throat> so I went in, and this. Uh, little fellow with a brush haircut and a very sour expression on his face was sitting there. And the Admiral said to me, uh, Rod, I want you to meet uh, Admiral Byrd. So I went over and shook hands with him and I said, how are you, Dick? And he said to me, uh, are we acquainted? <laughs> and I said, yes. He says, we've met before? I said, yes. He said, I've never seen you before in my life. And he was great on this kind of thing to get you rocking on your heels. I said, well, you got into a little bit of trouble on the way to the South Pole with carbon monoxide poisoning, and uh, I was one of the radio amateurs that carried the 
the message back to your base in Boston. He said, oh, you're the Canadian. And right away, there was a, uh, a rapport developed right, right off. Uh, I've seen him a couple of times since. I'm not even aware whether he's still alive or not. But uh, he was a tremendous disciplinarian, and he applied that discipline to good effect in the, uh, in, at the South Pole. Now, on my current operation of amateur radio station, we often talk to the South Pole, and yeah. he's still known around that part of the country. Well, he was quite mm -hmm. a he's quite a man, but I, I guess he sort of uh, wanted to stand on his dignity too. <laughs> you, well, somebody calling him Dick uh, coming into the I office. I don't think it was dignity, George. Uh, it was just that his sense of discipline and what was right yeah. mm -hmm. uh, was important to him. And uh, here was this. Uh, a stranger calling him by his first name, and this was very upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, <clears throat> what about uh, mm -hmm. Howard Hughes, uh, who well, was in the see. aircraft business during the war, and uh, uh, did you ever have anything to do with him? Well, I had a bit to do with him uh, during the war, and uh, a little bit afterwards. He was an extraordinary man. Uh, I remember he picked me up one time at, at the airport in a beat-up old Chevrolet car, and then he borrowed six dollars from me in order to buy enough gas to get us back to the plant. He never had any money in his pocket, but he was Did a Did you ever get your six dollars back? I don't think history uh, no, uh, confirms no. that, no. no but he, I, I know he always borrowed money, he never carried money. He never carried money. Now, he had a very interesting way in some ways like C.D. Howe, and he had a very interesting way of doing business and negotiating. Uh, when you sat down with him, if you did sit down, quite often the negotiation was done on, you know, on uh, your feet. He would say, now, this is the problem like this, and I see it this way. You got any questions? No? Well, do it. Uh, he was very direct, and he never ever took an airplane that he designed up that he didn't fly at first he flew before the test pilot which is very creditable i found him a very interesting man i was disappointed in some of the uh, movie pictorials of uh, him they didn't really do the man justice well maybe not for the earlier part of his career when you knew him when i he was still a sort of viable person i guess it's real tragedy the way he ended up the way he ended up that's right but I tell me about, like, I understand the main business you did with uh, him was done in a men's washroom. That's right, but I didn't plan to bring that up. <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, he only had so much time for you. That's now, right. Uh, so you followed him into the men's washroom now to tell us what happened there. He sent a man to bring me. He did? Uh, yes. Because oh. he, he was anticipating the meeting. Yeah. So he, uh, uh, he just simply... Uh, you told him your problem, and uh, uh, he said, fine? Oh, yes. Uh, we were considering buying some of the airplanes that he was designing, and one of the ones that he really uh, piled up. Uh, I think it was called the Black Widow. That was one of the problems. Uh, every country had a different name for their airplanes. Every, every service had a different number. And, uh, you know, a Harvard was a Harvard. It was an AT-6 for the U.S. Air Force, and it was an SNJ for the for the U.S. Navy, and something else for the British. Uh, well, else? now, uh, what about uh, C.D. Howe? Uh, 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 not only did he look after the procurement of industrial aircraft and so on. But he also afterwards headed up the Department of Reconstruction. Uh, what's yes. your opinion, frankly, of C.D. Howe as his worth to Canada? Well, nothing but the best, actually. Uh, <clears throat> he was probably the most direct man I think I've ever uh, uh, met or worked with. Uh, he wouldn't accept anything commonplace. It had to be perfect. And he would not accept defeat. If he sent you to do something, it had to be done. And uh, I remember when he finally lost the election, he really couldn't believe it had ever happened. Uh, 
his uh, a lot of the meetings that I uh, have had with him quite often it was repetitive would end up in uh, and I made a note of it here ended up in the, the final goodbye statement he never called me Rod like most people did but he called me Mac and he says Mac I don't care how you do it I don't want to know how you do it but don't come back until it's done and, th and this was his uh, credo for operating that department and it, it worked uh, in a bargaining session he was absolutely amazing I've been with him on several with the United States uh, War Production Board and others he always carried his own briefcase but he kept it between his feet under the table he had some notes on the back of an envelope and the walls of that room would be lined with people supporting the people that were sitting at the table there might be 50 or 60 people in the room and there was Mr. Howe and perhaps two observers from Canada and that was it and he he always had the right statistics and uh, he was very very capable on that kind of thing he was another man like Hughes that used to say that was the way it was but this is the way it's going to be you know? yeah. uh, I can't really say anything no. uh, no, I think uh, uh, I think everybody, you know, recognizes <clears throat> that he was a man of tremendous stature and tremendous importance oh, yeah. for uh, for Canada. Well, let's we're going to come back to C. D. Howe anyway in a minute. Let's go. We uh, are. <laughs> the war is over, and uh, you're still down in uh, Washington, and you're not with the Department of Procurement anymore. Uh, and you had a few years there. Uh, what about this one with uh, Ball? Uh, or uh, Bab, Charlie Bab. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was after I left government service and was in New York. I went to work for Charlie Bab, who was a an aircraft broker from whom I bought a lot of airplanes during the war. Uh, do you want to discuss that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an amusing episode tied in with that. Well, Charlie Bab was a used aircraft broker. Uh, and I was working for him both in New York and in Glendale, California. Some of the things that happened to a used car lot operator are, are uh, happened to aircraft brokers. The only thing was that you had more interesting uh, kinds of operations. They, uh, I sold airplanes to Haile Selassie that uh, Charlie Babb had bought in war surplus. Uh, we had uh, a lodestar that was going to Bolivia, and we bought it from uh, War Assets Corporation in Canada, actually, and refitted it in Glendale, California. And uh, we got the air, cert the air uh, worthiness certificate for the engine and the airframe and propellers. It was in excellent shape, and uh, we notified the Bolivian government that they could come and get their airplane. So they sent a man up. And he was a funny little fellow. He was full of beans and push and shove, and he had a great big suitcase with him. And he got out of the uh, airplane at Glendale and uh, took a taxi over to the office, and he says, where's my airplane, you see? And Charlie says, well, here's the bill of sale and the certificate of airworthiness, but where's the money? And he says, oh, it's there. And he pointed <laughs> at the suitcase. Charlie says, there? He says, yes, we, Charlie says, why do you need such a big box for a check? He says, that's not a check. And he opens it up for us, and there was everything in that suitcase except Spanish doubloons, you know. <laughs> uh, an interesting way to solve that problem, George, if you ever run into it again. Uh, Charlie says, get it out of here, it's hot. He went down on a Saturday afternoon to the Western Union. And they took it. They did. And uh, it took a little while, but he came back with a Western Union certified check. So there's one way to solve that. <laughs> well, that's kind of interesting. That now there's another person you worked with too there, uh, right after the war, the Philco Company, or with them. Oh yes. Well, the Philco, I was with the branch or the sub subsidiary company, Philco International Corporation. That did all of the Philco export business. They had their own office 
and uh, operating uh, operations were right in the New York um, area. Uh, Mr. Dempster McIntosh was the president, and uh, I got the job as assistant to the president. Uh, this was my first exposure to merchandising of that kind, stoves, refrigerators, you know, the, the usual line of, 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 of product that Philco built. And uh, <clears throat> as assistant to the president, you get involved in every conceivable facet of that particular business. Uh, we did a bang-up job, I think, and we worked with General Marshall on the Marshall program. Uh, my boss, Mr. McIntosh, went into the diplomatic service. So before, long before that happened, I started uh, looking around for another job. Well, that, <laughs> this is your job here. We have this, uh, this is what the, you became an airplane salesman for a year or so. Right? Yes, uh, Philco, or not Philco, but uh, I joined Convair, Consolidated Volte Aircraft Corporation in San Diego, and they sold built and sold these airplanes that were really a Bush airplane. At least they thought it was a Bush airplane. And uh, the Convair 240 for airline work. And I worked with uh, what was known as Trans-Canada Airlines then on the 240 program, which they did not buy. But these Bush airplanes really went like, like hotcakes. Uh, this little one was an experimental one, and uh, I bored it because I wanted to get a picture. and. Uh, they flew alongside me and took the picture. Uh, the one thing that happens, and it's reflected in a lot of the other businesses that uh, uh, of a Canadian subsidiary of a foreign company, they don't always understand the problems that Canada or Canadians have. And this airplane, as you can see, has got wheels. Uh, I uh, got in touch with the engineering people and the executive in San Diego and said I wanted the airplane with floats so that we could use our lakes. And then it would be maybe a Bush airplane. And then I also wanted the airplane certificated with uh, skis. Well, I got the skis through in the first of June on the particular year and I got the floats just as the snow started to come down in November. So there was a little hiatus on the serviceability of that airplane. But that was a very good airplane. And uh, I was up at uh, Point of Barrel a couple of summers ago, and I flew out of North Bay over to Point of Barrel and in the rain. And I was sitting on the right-hand side. And the rain was coming in around the windscreen, and I was getting very wet. And I remembered I had sold that airplane in Vancouver, and it had a leak then, <laughs> right at the beginning. <laughs> well, listen, Rod, we're getting along here. We want to get to the are. St. Thomas. You shouldn't lead me into these things. Huh? You shouldn't lead me into these things. <laughs> well, it kind of served you right. You sold a plane that had a leak, and you got a ride in it anyway. Now, then you went back again. Uh, now, C.D. Howe, the war's over. Now his problem is he's geared up all the industries in Canada, produce tanks, produce airplanes, produce... Uh, cars, trucks, everything needed for war, and uh, then we come to a peace economy, and he's now faced with the job of helping Canadian industry that yeah. really burgeoned during the war. That That's right. just blew up, expanded. Uh, he has to now try to convert them to a peacetime industrial economy. So you went back with the Department of Reconstruction. Well, that's right. Uh, I moved up from, uh, from Washington. D.C., Department of Def uh, Munitions and Supply. And we got into the Department of Reconstruction and we started disposing of War Assets Corporation's uh, tremendous stock of some of it usable. Yeah. And uh, I had the job of organizing the aircraft division of that uh, company. <clears throat> and uh, not long after, we was really were well down the road in destroying a lot of this uh, military equipment, uh, the problem in Korea was beginning to stick its head up. And uh, I was down two or three times to Washington and realized that the American Armed Forces were getting ready again. And already they had 
the equivalent of the first World War II War Production Board, and they were starting to allocate machine tools and materials that would be used in, if there was a war. So, uh, having brought that news back to Ottawa, uh, I was sent down there to reestablish the framework for another Department of Munitions and Supply, but this one was called the Department of Defense Production in the Washington office. And I worked at that for a little while, and then they sent down a big uh, bureaucracy to take this over, and they copied exactly what we had during the First World War. Then I was moved back to Ottawa to work with Canadian industry in redesigning or redeveloping their uh, factories to suit the new technology that had built up as a result of World War II. Well, then, this so is how you back. came to uh, 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 have your meeting with Mr. Weatherhead, who uh, <laughs> yes. is one of those Ohio gentlemen who started really the first uh, <clears throat> prominent industry in St. Thomas to move here from Ohio. And uh, he was a remarkable man himself. He was a sort of American C.D. Howell in a small way, wasn't he? Yeah. Same type of man. Now, what? <clears throat> uh, this is how you came to St. Thomas. Can you tell us how, how that happened? Well, I had been negotiating with Mr. Kilmer, who was their Canadian vice president here, and Mr. Weatherhead for a, a capital assistance uh, program to build some new buildings over here in St. Thomas. Uh, the arguments became a little bit uh, bitter and finally, one day, without any warning, my door flew open and A.J. Weatherhead Jr., as he called himself, came through that door like a bullet. <laughs> and he plopped down in front of me and he said, uh, I've been had and I don't like it. And uh, when can you get out of here because I'm going to hire you? I'm well, sure he didn't say it in that kind of language. Well, uh, no, I've had to, uh, you know. He had a few uh, extra words. So it, it worked out very well. And uh, uh, then he said, well, I got a, I got a company of, uh, of uh, business consultants in St. Thomas now. We're trying to improve the company. And I would like to, you, you to go down there and help them. So I went down. And that's how I managed to arrive here. I, anything I've ever tried to do, George, never turned out. But... These darn things keep heading my way, and I can't help it. And that's, so you just really came down here to spend about a year. Two years. Two years. Yeah. I, my contract with him was for two years, and, uh, and I wasn't planning to stay any longer. I've been here 25. <laughs> well, uh, uh, how did you, uh, you stayed with the Weatherhead outfit then for two years during this reconstruction phase, eh? Yeah, that's correct. Well, then you want to proceed with the, uh, yeah. what happened next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I went to a reception that the city put on for the Eager Machine Company's uh, uh, U.S. Exec executive here, and I was introduced to a man who turned out to be a radio amateur and also a private pilot. And one thing led to another. And he asked me if I would be interested in setting up the operation here. Well, they'd already built the building. And Don Whistlecraft, who had done a beautiful job, he'd put together all the financial aspects of this in anticipation of the building being finished. Uh, I went in there and uh, became their Canadian vice president, and we built up the sales department uh, into a real good... A productive organization under Jack Bissett. Now this was the Jaeger company. This is Jaeger. Yeah, I had already left. Uh, already left Weatherhead, and then because you'd uh, not before I had this nailed no, down. No, no, but uh, you had talked to this man Jaeger uh, by, uh, by uh, ham operators. Oh, for years. Yeah, and so you knew each other, and uh, he yeah. knew what you were capable of, and uh, so he offered. Well, it, offer. it helped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was uh, Tubby Sparling I said to him, you know, uh, Bob, right here's got the same, the same kind of junk in his basement as you've got. Maybe you ought to start talking. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
Well, then, uh, you want to, we have a, you were with Jaeger for how many years? Nine. Nine years. Yeah. We have a couple of uh, pictures of uh, Jaeger uh, products here. Is there a line of light down the middle of it? What? Or is it? It's all right, no flares. Is it? No, that's okay, that's on the screen. Well, this right. is one of their products. It's known as an air compressor. And uh, we built them with uh, gasoline engines and uh, diesels. Some of these were delivered as far north as Frobisher Bay. Were they? Yeah. And we have another one here, which is a... Um, uh, that's that, I that, call it a that's cement a, mixer, that's but a you say it's a mixer. concrete mixer. Those are not cement mixers. All right. <laughs> They're concrete mixers. Yeah. Uh, for the benefit of any others that might happen to be listening, uh, a cement mixer is, mixes the crushed limestone and turns into a, a uh, <coughs> into the bonding agent in concrete. But a concrete mixer mixes stone, sand, cement, and water. I see. And that's a concrete mixer. These are. Uh, they did a lot of design work here in St. Thomas. George Clark. Uh, produced this one, and it has a very, very fine control system, which the American company adopted. So that, uh, uh, but Jaeger is still here, isn't it? Jaeger is still here. It is the only active uh, part of the company. I see. And uh, they've done extremely well, and Don Whistlecraft, uh, after I moved on, he became their Canadian president, and uh, he did a perfect job for them. They were very, very pleased with it. And he was an easy man to get along with, too. Oh, man. Well, then, uh, with uh, Jaeger, uh, you uh, were just about ready to retire. And then... Uh, I didn't think so, but... But uh, you met another man named Flood, then, eh? Yes, a man named Tom Flood came into my office one day and said that uh, Ye Galleon were going to acquire the Alice Chalmers plant. And uh, he had observed what we were doing at Jaeger, how we had built it up from uh, right from the ground, so to speak, and uh, he thought that he would like to have me come and join uh, the Galleon Company, manufacturing company. And there was only one catch in it. He saw me in September, and they bought the, the Alice Chalmers plant in November, and we had to have the first product, manufactured product, rolling off the line in April. So it was a real hard drive to come. Well, we just have a couple pictures here. We may as well show. There's the Alice Chalmers plant in November Pardon. when you bought it, and it's empty. And then here it is in April when the machines are stalled, and it's Every, off. Everything and, going, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so you made your deadline there, all right. We made that yeah. deadline, yes. And now, Galleon was kind of an interesting company because um, they made some marvelous equipment here, right? Uh, well, here's the equipment and its application. Yeah. Pardon? This is the equipment and its application, this picture. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, that tremendous uh, crane, and it's lifting a hovercraft yeah. down at Montreal. Yeah. And yeah. Did you arrange that for a publicity? Well, uh, for advertising? Well, you've been reading my mail. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, <clears throat> I tried to get a uh, crane into Expo 67, and we offered it to the corporation to use for installing any of the exhibitors' equipment and also for completing some of the building work that they were doing. Uh, there was no way that they were going to buy a galleon crane. They, uh, other people had thought of this long before I did. So there was no way I could get it in. But uh, I had a ride in this hovercraft up the St. Lawrence River, which was quite spectacular, from Montreal up the Lachine Rapids in the Lake St. Louis. And uh, uh, they said they were going to use this to give rides at Expo 67. And um, I, thought, I thought it might be worthwhile offering the crane to them. And uh, they said they'd be delighted to have it. And I said, we aren't going to uh, 
supply any fuel, but every night, or whenever the crane was not in operation, I want you to extend the boom to its maximum and leave it up there all night. And then you could see Galleon from one end of Expo 67 <laughs> to the other, and it worked. Yeah. That was one, there's another one there. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, this one is not recommended. This is a Galleon roller being lifted by, road roller, being lifted by the crane, and this fella in the cab is vulnerable. Never lift a, a, a road roller over the cab of a crane. No, no, the Industrial Safety Board won't get after you for that one. Yeah. Well, now listen, unfortunately, Galleon, only here a couple years. Now, what happened? Like, uh, one thing, flood, uh, the change of ownership or change of presidency? There was a change of ownership, and uh, the objectives became different. Uh, the need for a Canadian manufacturing operation uh, became uh, really unnecessary and expensive. And uh, they decided that they were going to consolidate, and they were doing it with all the other companies that they owned in Canada, not necessarily in this particular line, uh, bringing back the manufacturing operations under one roof. So they decided to do that, and uh, we closed up here, but they kept a... Uh, Sales office in uh, uh, sales office in St. Thomas, and uh, until recently, uh, it was moved to Toronto. I see. Yeah. Well, now uh, uh, Murphy's Law seems to be operating a bit there with uh, uh, that industry. Now, before we go on to uh, a couple others, I just like to ask: you were associated with. Uh, Weatherhead, you're associated with Jaeger and uh, Galleon. What are the problems of a, a plant manager in St. Thomas uh, who's working for an American subsidiary uh, and uh, uh, there must be conflict of power? He's working for someone who's in a different atmosphere, a different background. Well, George, uh, there are as many different problems as there are different companies. Uh, the problems develop quite often at the head office in the United States or Britain or, yeah. or wherever. Uh, one of the problems that uh, has to be carefully solved before the company in Canada can really get underway is that the Management executive at the head office understands the Canadian problems. And this amusing story about the airplane for, with wheels, skis, and floats applies in almost any other kind of uh, manufacturing operation in this country because the engineering that's been done on some of these products makes them unsuitable for Canadian conditions. And uh, you need to know uh, whether the people that you visit in the he at the head office really understand the problem. And uh, I've, uh, I've found that, that uh, that's really the first thing to do when the yeah. chief executive for the Canadian subsidiary company is told that he has the job, that he spends two or three weeks at the head office understanding what the head office's problems are yeah. and explaining to them what must be done to be successful in Canada. That seems to be a logical thing and not a very strange remark, but it's surprising how many times it gets overlooked. The next thing is that uh, you can... How are we doing for time? Are we, We're all right. We got uh, ten minutes. Yeah, ten. ten minutes. Well, I'll be out of breath before then. The, uh, <clears throat> the thing that the Canadian subsidiary executive must know is how our our tariff uh, operations work, what it's going to cost them to bring some parts and some materials into Canada for incorporation in the Canadian product, and what the tariff arrangements are to get a completed export vehicle into a foreign country, because you've got to know both sides of the of the problem. And then, too, there's little things like uh, some of the components that are already made, ready for installation, that come into this country. And if the, if the device goes back to the United States, 
there's a, a throwback that you can recover at least part of the duty that was paid. No. Uh, you also need to have a very clear knowledge of, uh, or somebody that has it in your organization, a clear knowledge of uh, the value of a Canadian dollar in these countries and uh, also the value of the uh, foreign exchange when it arrives here. And you must update that constantly. Uh, these are just two of a myriad of, uh, of problems that can develop. And as I say, everyone's different. Now, when I was a member of the Canadian Manufacturers Association and we had the London branch, a lot of uh, our people in this town and in London used to get together after the meeting and, and uh, say, well, what kind of difficulties are you having? And, and uh, one chap would have a solution for something another fellow and another company was working at it. It worked out very well. CMA provide a very excellent service in this regard. Uh, you could go on and on, but I, we'd be here a long time. Well, I think we better cover a few more things here. You, uh, so Galleon moved back to the States. We've had uh, Alice Chalmers move back to the States. Galleon moved back. We've had a Alice few Chalmers lost. moved to Montreal. Eh? Montreal, right. Yeah. And uh, uh, the Richier company from France never came at all. They were yeah. going to come. Uh, so we've had some losses and some gains. Um, so when... Uh, uh, Galleon left, then you went, uh, <laughs> what happened to you then? Well, I just didn't want to sit and sell product, and I had an excellent vice president of sales uh, doing it, so there was no reason to uh, hang around. So I hadn't made up my mind when a gentleman from uh, uh, Timberland Ellicott down in Woodstock came along. I had met him at the Canadian Manufacturers Association dinners and uh, he asked me whether I would be willing to come down to uh, Woodstock for a year or two because their president had had a heart attack and uh, they didn't know what's, whether survival was there or not. In addition to that they had some problems. So uh, this looked pretty good and I, I, I went down there and I was their president for two years. Then I developed low blood pressure and that terminated my active Life. Well, then you retired again then after Timberland Ellicott, and then of course another thing happened in St. Thomas, another industry, that was the St. Thomas metallic uh, industry. Well, Tom Bell died. He, him, he was yeah. their general manager and uh, vice president. And uh, they, I was riding back with their secretary treasurer on the airplane to St. Thomas, and. He was wondering what he was going to do with Tom Bell uh, gone. And uh, I said, well, I'll go over and mind the store for you for a while, but don't expect me to do anything because I don't know anything about grave vaults. But I'll be glad to make sure that uh, everybody is there. So I took that job on, and I've never had so much fun in my life. That is a real interesting industry. It was. Yes, it was. And I went to... One of the uh, the conventions, the casket manufacturers' yeah. conventions, and I had a good time at there too. Those people really produce beautiful equipment. Yeah. It hasn't got wheels on. Yeah. <laughs> well, how long did you? When did you leave them? They moved uh, eventually. Moved out. Of well, town. they decided to go to Quebec, yeah. and uh, they went to Granby, yeah. and <clears throat> they were bought out by a, another chap, and they really didn't want to stay in it, so. Oh. Uh, and I didn't want to go to Quebec. I left Quebec way back in 1939, and I can't even speak French now. Well, then, uh, you weren't content even to retire after that. You, uh, since that time, you have been doing uh, some work as private consultant. Well, you know, this is kind of silly on my part, but... Uh, I got a telephone call one day and said, would you mind coming over? I got a little problem and we'll have lunch. So we'd have lunch and he'd pay for the lunch and I'd give him some advice and go away. And it took a few of those finally to get through my thick head that this was a way to make some money. And it has worked out that way. So I keep about four of them going all the time. It's, it's interesting. And troubleshooting is uh, 
like in the original construction days, is a very entertaining aspect. Well, tell me something, uh, Rod. We don't have much time. I think we've got a couple minutes to close it up. We haven't said a thing about your wife. We haven't really said a thing about uh, your uh, ham radio uh, operation and the research work you do on that. But you came to St. Thomas. You've been here 25 years. You came for a couple of years, and you've stayed here through the working of Murphy's Law and one accident after another, or one fortuitous event after another. Have you enjoyed St. Thomas? Oh, I really have. Oh, I, this is a great place. And uh, when I came here, uh, George Dingman uh, took Gene and I in hand, and they made sure that we met everybody in the town, and we've had just. Uh, a wonderful time and a, a recipients of a lot of kindness. Yes. Well, that's that's very nice. My I, wife, my wife, incidentally, is also a pilot. She likes the town too. She she flies too. She, she does. She yeah. has a pilot's license. Does she really? Yeah. Well, uh, listen, Rob. Perhaps we got a minute here to uh, just talk about ham radio operation. You are uh, you've contacted every continent, and you have you speak to people in Russia. Well, yeah, the, uh, uh, my, I got my license in November 1919, yeah. and it still it was only abrogated during the war, and it's still going, it's still going strong. We've talked to every continent, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Well, I think perhaps a better wipe up, Rod. I'd like to thank you very much for. Uh, giving us a brief survey of, uh, of your life and uh, the uh, interesting things you've done. I'd like to remind our viewers that uh, this interview with Mr. McDonald uh, will be, uh, uh, if you watch your uh, announcements on all of you, it'll be run a couple more times. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Remember, we'll be on the second Wednesday in uh, December. Thank you and good evening.